You are listening to Adoptees On, the podcast where adoptees discuss the adoption experience. This is season three, episode 14, Nicole R. I'm your host, Haley Radke. Nicole Rademacher is a multicultural adoptee and a professional contemporary artist. She tells us about her reunion with her biological parents and her two brothers and how it has informed her creative practice. Nicole lets us in on some of her projects, including one that is still in the works, and I'm still in awe of the brilliance of it. We wrap up with some recommended resources, and as always, links to everything we talk about today are on the website adoptizon.com. Let's listen in. I'm so pleased to welcome to Adoptees On, Nicole Rademacher. Welcome, Nicole. Hi. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so excited to chat with you. I know you do a ton of different things, which hopefully we'll touch on everything. Um, But why don't you start out and just share your story with us? I am a a multicultural adoptee. Um, My biological father is Mexican and um, my biological mother is white. I grew up in a white family. I was adopted into a white family with an adopted brother. So I grew up always knowing I was adopted. Um, I had a, I have a really great relationship with my adoptive family. I, I always, always wanted to search out my, my biological family. It was something that was, ever since I can remember, that that was something I wanted to do. I was adopted in, um, in Wisconsin, in Milwaukee, through Catholic Social Services. I remember when I was 18, I called Catholic Social Services in Milwaukee, and they told me when I turned five, they changed the age from 18 to 21. Oh. And I was devastated. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, no, but I, I finally turned 18. And my adoptive parents were super supportive. When I turned 21, I was kind of in a different, you know, 21-year-old state. But uh, just before before I turned 26, uh, at the with the encouragement of a friend of mine, I contacted the Catholic Social Services again and filled out the paperwork. And I happened to be finishing my undergraduate degree. And so I actually got to do it for free, which was pretty exciting. You know, I, I thought this was going to take ages. I read about searches that people, you never find your biological parents or they find you and there's this, they don't or they can't meet with you or, or meet you or have any type of, you, know, you just never get that connection. But I was really fortunate that, um, I, I mean, I think I was fortunate <laughs> that uh, three months later, in March of that same year, I was contacted by a social worker, and he had found my biological parents because my biological grandparents, my maternal grandparents had never moved, and so he still had that the same contact information, and my biological parents were married two years after I was born. To each other. Yes, to each other. Right. Like that's really beautiful and really amazing. And I have this whole family and I have two younger brothers that are full younger brothers, but it was, uh, really difficult. I mean, as any adoptee that finally meets your, your biological parents, it's like, I remember this bath that I took that was like this eternal bath where I just kept looking at my skin and, and touching each part of my skin and realizing that, that belonged to something other than just me because for the first 26 years of my life it had only belonged to me and I didn't look like I mean even though I grew up in a white family and I totally pass for completely white I don't look any you know my parents are nordic and tall and blue eyes and big bones and I you know I'm petite I'm 5'2 with dark hair and brown eyes but it was weird right because you're supposed to be super happy But I felt this added layer of, I guess it's rejection. I don't know what the word is. It took me, once I found that out, it actually took me a long time to call them and make the contact. I remember very specific, like I wrote it really, I was shaking. I was at work when he called me and gave me the information. I just kind of stared at that number and those names for weeks and didn't know what to do with it. I called and I got voicemail. And so I hung up and I called again and I got voicemail and I just like wasn't calling at the right time. You know, I remember I talked with them and I, I don't remember the specifics, but yeah, it's like, it's this big blur of emotions. Mm. 
Can you talk a little bit more, Nicole, about knowing that your parents stayed together and had more kids? And like, what does that feel like? It's kind of cool in one sense, because I never, my adopted brother and I, like there was so much that we could have done to bond as adoptees, but we never did that. They were just really different people. So it's, it's cool to have another two other options <laughs> as brother, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, but it's also like, I don't know, like would these, if they had kept me and then we'd live together, like would these two people exist? Would I be the older sister? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's it, but it's tough. It feels like, especially now being a mom mm-hmm. and having a child and he didn't come at a super opportune time, my child. We've been talking about having kids, but not at the moment that he came. And so there is a bit of um, uh, resentment or something. At the, I don't know if it's resentment towards them, but it's like, couldn't you have like toughed it out? Couldn't you have figured it out? Hmm. But, you know, I mean, they were 19. And I remember when I was 19 thinking like, this is the age that, that they were. And knowing that I was still just a child. So, I mean, I have a lot of empathy, but there, I also have a lot of, um, just unresolved emotions around it. There is an anger, but I think my anger is, it's not as strong. I think if, I don't know, it's not, it's not as strong as maybe it was before, but like before it was like masked by all these other things because I thought I was supposed to be super happy because I was 26 when I met them and really unsure of who I was. I really thought I was still in this, in the fog. Right. And so then learning that I was like, well, I'm supposed to be happy. This is really amazing. Like I don't have to find my biological mother and my biological father. Like both of my biological parents are together and I have this whole family and it's like picture perfect and we'll just tie a bow and Mm -hmm. it's great. And yet, (laughs) so how did that, that (laughs) what was, what happened next? (laughs) And, and so I being 26 and and thinking it was this picture perfect bow, like they sent me, they sent me pictures of them. And that was profound. Just seeing my own physical attributes mirrored in, in ancestors and in people, um, within, or maybe like a month later, I went down and met them all. And being the ideological person that I am, I stayed with them. Um, for I think a week and a half and wow. yeah, I know I didn't know what I was doing. I would never do that now. And I, and I was like, oh, well I have a family, so I'm going to be in this family. Right. My youngest brother was 16 at the time. And, um, so he was in the house. It, it no one knew what to do. You know, like now looking back at it, it's been 13 years. I didn't know what to do. I think my, my brother who was 16 was the only person who know what, knew what to do because he like totally was oblivious to all of these emotions that were going on, <laughs> <laughs> but no one else really knew what to do. I, you know, like, how do you treat this person? That's your, that's your child. That's not your child that you haven't known that you didn't, you know, you didn't raise. And so even though they look like, I, I really do look like both of them and I act like them too, which is, you know, that profound thing about genetics yet they didn't know me and I didn't know them. And so here we are as adults trying to get to know one another. And I didn't see it then. And like the following year, yeah, the following year I was living in Europe and they came to visit and we went on this month long trip together. (laughs) And that was when the shit kind of hit the fan. There was one point where I did something emotionally, uh, like I talked to my youngest brother in a certain way and there was a lot of tension and I had no idea I had done this. And my biological mom said something to me like, Oh, you really hurt Luis. And I was like, well, Luis needs to tell me that, Mm. you know? And it, 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 it was like really in your face, like, who are you? What are you? You're not my mom he's my brother because he's my brother and he'll always be my brother, but I don't know him. And I think we still go through these things. Um, I talk with him often. My, who's now the middle brother who grew up as the oldest, his sister, I mean, his girlfriend's sister lives in Los Angeles where I live. 
And so he'll often end up coming here and visiting. And so we have this growing relationship and we're growing it like, like you do with your extended family, like with your cousins, if you don't live in the same, I mean, I don't live in the same area as the cousins I grew up with, my cousins that are my part of my adoptive family. And so we're growing it that way. You know, there's still weird hurdles. I think for the last two, three years, I've really been delving into the adoptee community, at least here in Los Angeles. And I think digitally as well, which is, you know, how I found adoptees on. It's really helped me to understand who I am and how all these pieces fit in together. I, and I think that how my relationship is, is with my biological family, I think it helps that too. It helps me understand the situation that they were in and kind of calms the anger Mm. because I can logically think about it and understand that, but still allow me to feel those emotions, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I have talked to so many adoptees, more than I would expect, that have been in your situation, who have searched and then found their bio parents are married and have more kids, full siblings. And it's just like, it sounds unusual, but it's it actually happens quite a bit. And so I just think that's so much to process, which is why I asked you kind of how you felt about it to give some language to people about that. I don't know. It's for me, you know, when I found my parents were um, teenagers and so there's this sense of understanding of why they couldn't parent. And yet still there's a lot of feelings like, well, why didn't their parents help them? And, you know, so it's Mm -hmm. just like the mixed bag. I feel like we're always like walking that line, right? (laughs) Yeah. And I think, you know, as an adoptee, you always feel like you're, you're the singular being, you're this island out there. And because you're growing up in, in this place where no one's mirroring or you're not mirroring anybody and you don't look like anybody around you. And then from, and you know, and then all the tales you've ever been told of people who find their, or could possibly find their biological family is, you know, the the parents aren't together and they're all messed up and all of this stuff and blah, blah, blah. And then I find out that, oh, my parents are together and actually they're in a higher tax bracket than my adoptive parents. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, And, you know, and then you, and you feel like, oh, I must be this anomaly. I'm finding that I'm not an anomaly. There's lots of us out there. And I know that you've talked to so many adoptees, you know, we, we do exist and there's, there's a lot around that. And, and I actually, um, I mean, we'll talk about this in, in a little bit, but that's one of the things that I'm, I'm processing in, in my creative practice is this idea of what could have been that never was, Mm. you know, and I, it's not even trying to decide whether one thing was better because that's, you know, that's a, don't talk about that. Like, I don't want to think about that, but to sit in a space that never existed and just, and just kind of let it be and feel your feelings with that and just give yourself the space to do that or I'm giving myself the space to do that. It's so wild to think about back to when we were born and just that that life ended there and there's a different life that we're living. I love that, giving yourself an opportunity to process that. And so many of us just, we either go there and we really fantasize about it or we just totally block it out. (laughs) Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, and it's all good. Like, I found myself, you know, because that family exists, like, really kind of daydreaming about it. And I'm like, I don't think this is really healthy for me. I don't think that this is really helping me. So, you know, trying to figure out a space where I'm allowed to do that, but I'm not carrying it too far where. 
maybe it's wasted energy, you know, where I really need to concentrate on what's here, but I don't want to shame myself into not being allowed to think about that. That's pretty good. That's pretty okay. good. <laughs> I was just like, oh my gosh. So you hinted at it. Nicole, what do you do? I am a professional contemporary artist. The point of departure in my work is my adoption and my reunion with my biological family. So I look at nonverbal communication between people as a starting point and really kind of look at gesture, space, and object as cultural facts of that, and kind of look at identity construction, ideas of belonging, intimacy, alienation. I've been really delving into ethnography and psychology as a way to... So it's not just about me and my experience. So I'm, I'm starting to understand it in context and how it might how it's shaped by the world around us and how what my experiences might also relate to other people and um, other people who are non-adoptees as well. And what are some of the types of projects that you would work on? So I have a, a couple projects that are kind of half to big that I'm working on right now that I, I just kind of want to talk about one of them because it's the one that I hinted at. And then the other projects I'm working on are really community-based. So the projects I'm working on that it, it's called invisible, or I don't know, it's working title is Invisible Images. It's taking photographs of my biological family, of them as a family, and then figuring out how old my younger brothers are and then finding a picture of like doing the math. It's not, it's not very hard doing the math and trying to find a picture of me, um, not at the same age, but at the same time. So I'm 11 years older than my youngest brother. So if he looks like he's one, I'm trying to find a photograph of when I was 12. And using this um, optical toy that was popular in the 19th century, it's called a taumatrope, T-H-A-U-M-A-T-R-O-P-E. And basically it's this disc on one side, it's one picture. On the other side, it's another picture. And so using the, um, the theory of persistence of vision, where it, it basically, you, you oscillate it back and forth, and it appears in your mind that the images are together, even though they're separate. And it's dealing with this idea that they'll never be together, like this reality never happened. But what if it did happen? And then it would be, and so it's, it's only happening in my mind, right? And it's only happening in the mind of whoever's looking at this taumatrope. And so the strings, there's strings tied to each side and they're twirled really quickly between the fingers so that these two pictures blend together. Does that make sense? Yes. And I'm just like having like my jaw open, like I'm having this moment. <laughs> wow. That's incredible. And... And I actually need help to do this because it's so emotional for me. And and a good friend of mine is is helping me. She's actually tracing the images. So I'm finding the images. And then I kind of stare at them for a while. And I look at them in Photoshop together and kind of freak out. And it's a little bit too emotional for me to draw the images. And so she's actually drawing the images for me. What I'm picturing is... Uh, sometimes when I go to my bio family's house and every once in a while, you know, they'll bring out some pictures and just looking at old family photos is so difficult for me. Like, I love it. I want to take it all in and I want to absorb it all. And yet I'm always like, I'm not in any of these pictures. It's right? very triggering. And I have literally pictured what was I doing at this exact time. And so that's why I'm just like, that's amazing. I love that you thought of that. <laughs> so, I mean, my, my, my bio mom, when we met, she gave me a scrap. She'd put together. She's so lovely. And <laughs> she had put together the scrapbook of them for me of her and my biological father before I was born. So like them, when she went to visit them in Mexico and my aunts and uncles, both in Mexico and in Milwaukee and all of my cousins and my younger brothers and, you know, just this, the scrapbook. And so that's where those pictures are coming from. And otherwise I don't, I wouldn't know how to ask her for them. 
you know, and I asked my mom, my adoptive mother, I asked her to send me a bunch of pictures and she just went through stuff and just started sending me things. And she has no idea what I'm using them for. And it, it actually, I'm like, I usually post stuff on Instagram or whatever, just of like process based, but I can't, I can't bring myself to do it because they all follow me on Instagram. And I don't, I feel like I'm not doing anybody right by doing it, but I know I need to do it. So I don't know. My maternal, my biological maternal grandfather died recently. And I was so touched by actually being included in his obituary. Right. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, oh, I do belong. I'm actually here. I'm, I'm in this world. Yeah. So, yeah. So I don't, so like I said, it's half baked. I don't actually know where it's going. I don't know if I use the objects right now. The objects are just experiments, oftentimes doing visual work. I usually work in video, so I don't know if they become videos of that. And then the object is next to it. I'm not sure where that's going outside of that piece. I have a couple different community-based projects that I'm working on. Um, one, I'm kind of in a pause at, um, cause recently in the fall, I did a bunch of, um, workshops around it and it's called origin stories. So it's a community-based artistic project. It began as just an artistic project where I was exploring these imagined histories that I had as a, as a child. Everyone imagines that you're something else when you're a kid, but as we all know, as adoptees, it just, there's more staying power to the stuff you imagine as an adoptee, especially in a closed adoption, because you could be anyone or anything. And I had always latched on to this idea. My, I knew my biological father was Mexican, but I grew up in North Carolina and with a white family. And so I had no context for what Mexican meant. I had no um, idea of what Mexican culture was, except for what I'd learned in social studies class. And I grew up in the 80s, so I knew that there were Aztecs in Mexico. And um, I grew up in the 80s with Disney and Disney princesses. So I, you know, I fashioned myself to be this long last Aztec princess. Hmm. And right. <laughs> and at the same time, I, I did not have a studio at the time. So I had some space in my house that I was working in, but I didn't really have a lot of time to myself. Um, I have a son and he was one and a half. So anybody who has kids know that you, you really, you know, you don't have a lot of time for yourself. But the one thing I did have is um, my commute. And anyone who lives in Los Angeles knows that mm. commutes can be really long. I had all this time in the car to talk to myself. And I began to elaborate on the story and kind of just expand and explore what it what it was or what it could be. And this was the same time that I started going to adopt salons with Jeanette Yaffa or Jeanette Yaff, who is an MFT here in Los Angeles, also an adoptee. And so that was really the time when I, I felt I could explore myself as an adoptee and I could explore my community and I really could explore what that particular thing means in my work as an artist. So I just started creating the story and I, I'm like, okay, I'm this long lost Aztec princess or indigenous princess or whatever. I'll make up the story for how this, how this girl came to be. I researched fairy tales and I researched oral histories. And so I was like, well, I'll do this in the oral history tradition. And so I never wrote it down every day. I would just, or almost every day, I would just continue to tell the story and get further and further and further. In the end, I realized that it really wasn't about my story. It was about the fact that I could imagine the story and, and then how can I, as an artist and also somebody who um, works with the community, how can I kind of inspire or how can I help be a witness to other people figuring out what their story is or imagining their story? And so that's really how the workshop evolved. So that's it. So it's called Origin Stories. And it's been going on, I guess, for a couple of years. Originally, it was designed to empower adopted and foster people to record their unique histories. It's a two hours, about two hour workshop. 
and the the attendees, the participants work in groups to create a story using visual prompts. People will come to the workshop. I'll tell my story as an adoptee and give a background of the project. So I you know, tell them the same thing as far as imagining myself as this long lost Aztec princess. And, and then we talk a little bit about storytelling and what goes into storytelling. And then in the beginning, we're using these tarot cards as visual prompts so that people, you know, people who aren't usually creative always get really shy about it, even though everybody has this creativity. And so I wanted people to be relaxed about it, that they didn't have to invent everything, that they could, you know, rely on different things. But as I started to work with my community um, of adoptees and foster youth, I realized that the tarot cards I was using really, um, even though I hand chose them from different decks, really didn't speak to who they imagined themselves to be or who they wanted to be in the future. I began to expand it to the general public, to artists, to people who felt marginalized, because I think that's who we are as adoptees. We feel marginalized. Our story isn't told. Our narrative is like this same narrative that none of us really feel connected to about being saved or lucky or, you know, whatever, whatever it may be. And so on top, like after the storytelling part, there's this card making part. They make these three by five cards that is something about themselves or something that resonated with them about the stories that they, that they tell in this group. And then those cards are scanned and put into a deck that then get recycled back into the workshop. You come in, we, we talk as a group. I tell my story. We go into the storytelling part where you work in a group of three to five, create the story. You tell it back to the group. And then we take out, you know, the crayons and the markers and the watercolors and the drawing pencils and the collage materials. And then you're asked to create a card of something that resonated with you in the story or something that speaks to you and who you identify as. And so what does that do for you and the participants to really write this sort of fictional alternate story and process that way? Like what, what are some of the things that you're seeing happening from doing this? Well, it's been really interesting because as I opened it up to the general public and to people who felt marginalized, I started to realize how many people feel marginalized and how isolated a lot of us feel, whether or not we're adoptees. And how we as adoptees can kind of connect with these other groups. The workshop itself is, you know, I'm sharing something intimate. They're all, they're not very large workshops. I think the largest has been 25 people. I'm sharing something really intimate and I'm asking people to share, you know, this time with me. I also do these like breathing exercises beforehand to like ground everybody in really like the social emotional part of it so that there's this understanding that we're going to share this time together and it's not, and it's going to be something personal and it's not just a workshop. Oh, I'm going to come and learn how to collage something. Um, it's about something different and it's about something I'm asking them to go a little bit deeper. And I've been really surprised by what people, what people have done. And sometimes they don't, some people want to talk about it and some people don't want to talk about it. I also still do them with adoptees and one adoptee had this tracing paper on top of hers and it said death. And then when she went to share it with the group, because it was in this adoptee group where we actually go back and talk about it, she took the tracing paper off and just showed the collage and the drawing underneath. And I was like, but wait, but you know, I can't say she took it off. So there's, there's something where people are connecting with, with this idea of they can really imagine themselves as anything and, and who could they be? Processing our identity in so many different ways is so powerful. When you're talking about, you know, inviting the general public in that has been marginalized in some way also and having them identify with adoptees, I have some listeners now that don't have any tie to adoption and yet they find commonalities with us and some of the different experiences that we share and feelings and etc. And I just find that so 
fascinating. So I love that you are, um, that you're doing that as well and finding those connections. That's so cool. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because like I'll in passing talk with people about just being an adoptee and kind of not feeling like you belong or these ideas of identity and family and people will, things will resonate with them. But then when you spend like two to three hours with them in, and then you're seeing them produce something creative and you're, you know, I'm facilitating it. So I'm not actually creating the stories with them, but I'm listening to this story and to that story. And the stories are really kind of amazing because half of it was fiction and, the, and or part of it was fiction. And another part was like based on one person in the group, like something that happened to them. And then another person is based on something that happened to a friend of theirs or a family member of theirs. And so it's all this like fact and fiction that's all mixed together and people can't help but bring that in. And then from like an activism standpoint, in order for us as adoptees to really, we we have to find connections with other people out there and other communities that are bigger than ours that are fighting for their rights as well and fighting to be heard and for the, you know, for their voice and their narrative to be changed. And I think if we can really harness that, then, you know, we have a, we have a way in because there, you know, there's so many people right now fighting to, to have their narratives in the general collective society be changed and I don't, I don't know if we're on the top of that, you know, near the top of that list at all. So I think that if we can figure out how to figure out those connections with the other communities that are also marginalized and, um, and commonalities, and you know, like people have to bond together, whether or not you're part of the same group, we all are fighting for common goals. And I think there's something to this, like, we're showing up and saying, you know, we're adopted. It actually was a trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, these are the ways it's impacted me. Any way we can f- flip people's picture of adoption, right? Any way. And to start out by showing our heart and our wounds to someone else. And that's what they can see. And that's what they can identify and understand with. Like, that's amazing. Oh my gosh, Nicole, that's so cool. I love that you're doing this. I just I just want to go back. You said it's an oral tradition, meaning do these don't get written down? Do they get right. does anybody record them? Or is it just I audio record them? Okay. Right now I've just been saving the audio recordings. I need to go edit them and put them into the archive. I have an archive of the workshops I've done since April, which is since April, it's been with the whole card part of it. That's on my website and it includes some images of people in the workshop and then some of the cards that have been made in the workshops. Once I finish editing the audio, I'll start adding those to it. And those will just be the stories that people tell. Well, as a avid audio consumer... (laughs) (laughs) Did you know that about me? I don't know. How how could anyone I didn't know tell? that. No, I yeah. know. It's a surprise. Um, that's amazing. <laughs> oh, I love that so much. I'm a little behind on my audio editing. Why does it take a long time? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so good. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing about that. Let's go on to recommended resources. And I mean, for me, your website and all of these different things you've done um, is an amazing resource for people to check out. And um, so you're going to share that right at the end of the show where we can get in touch with you. But I love that you're adding these audio things from origin stories and you have videos from Pat. You have like it's the works like all your work is up there it seems like there's probably not everything but yeah tell us a little bit about what else we can find up there there's the origin stories is there gate pass which is a piece that I did that was up at the at the airport at LAX airport and that actually looks at privacy and security which also stems from you know my ideas of and my experience as an adoptee Potential Spaces, which is a project that I did thinking about hybrid cultures as you 
you know, being somebody who's in a multicultural relationship and then also growing up as a multicultural adoptee, you are a perpetual tourist, which was my, um, my thesis piece for my master of fine arts. And that's really looking at nonverbal communication between children and, um, and adults in their lives. And this is all found subjects. And so really trying to, as a voyeur, as an observer, um, which I find, I don't know if you find this as an adoptee, you're, you're always, you're always looking at how people are interacting and who people are and always wondering if that's somebody you're related to. And you're just kind of like dissecting all these little parts about what's going on. Oh, yes. Like, I feel like I am like a people watcher, but like exponentially. <laughs> yes. yes. So I, I took my people watching skills that I had been, um, you know, honing my entire life and uh, with my video camera and, and looked at kids in, in public spaces and how they related to one another. Is that there's a video of like, it looks like a little family and there's a little boy and they're at the bus stop. And, yes. Oh my God. That's part of it. I just yes. watched that and I was like, oh my goodness, this is incredible. It's very short and it's, you know, there's no words or anything. It was really moving. Oh, uh, good. I Thank you. Oh, yeah. So there's all these little gems on um, Nicole's website. So you should definitely go and look at it. It's just really, really amazing. You're doing su such cool stuff. Oh, cool. thank you. You're welcome. I mean it. I mean it. <laughs> You had sent me a link to the Celia Center Arts Festival. Can you talk a little bit about that? And Brian Stanton, actually, I interviewed oh, him and cool. he said, oh, yeah, Nicole um, did this whole thing. And this is what he was talking about. Yeah, 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 exactly. So Jeanette Yoff, um, she's a marriage and family therapist who's also an adoptee here in Los Angeles. She actually got me and Brian together. So I curated the visual art portion and then Brian programmed, I guess is the proper term you use. He programmed the performing arts part of it, but it was a, it was a day long festival of adoptee work. So we had professional artists as well as, you know, adoptees or foster youth that are still teenagers that sent in work. And we exhibited at the electric lodge here in, in Venice and it was really, it was really amazing because we had like over 200 people that came and we had workshops and we had the performances and we had spoken word poet. And then we had all of the artwork up and we had like a couple of videos that were going on around too. Like there was a documentary, Brian did his performance at the very end. It was like the show closer. It was just amazing. Oh, blank. Blank is yes. so good so good oh it's so moving it's mm -hmm. just no words for that we also had a panel of some of the some of the professional artists that were involved in the show to talk about their experience and that was um really moving for me and I just moderated it but um there was one artist Michael uh Gian Cristiano who he's a sculptor here in Los Angeles and he had found the call, I think through Facebook or something like that and sent in the sculptural work. And, you know, I realized that he'd had a career, you know, he's like an actual professional artist and has studied and sells work and can, you know, works in a studio. And so I invited him to be on the panel and he was fine with it. But then like the day before when we were installing, he was like, well, I don't know. And so finally he decided to do it. His, portion like what he told about his story was just so moving about he doesn't get along at all with his um, adoptive family and was I, I mean I don't want to necessarily talk for him but it was it was really amazing to have somebody who was so ambivalent about about doing this to then have something that really touched all of us mm. and so we're going to do it again um, we're just going to do we're going to do a very short visual portion of it in November of 2018 but it'll mainly be film and and performance and it'll be here in Los Angeles on the west side and I will be if you you know follow my my social media handles I will definitely be tweeting and posting about it so um but yeah it's a, um, you know it's it's a bit away I couldn't believe it when you sent me those links and I was watching there's like a a video recap that is 
I mean, I think it's at least five minutes long and it's got all of these different snippets from that day. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I wish I had been there. (laughs) That's like speaking my language. So, um, so cool. Yes, definitely going to watch out for that. And there was one other thing that you wanted uh, to recommend to us. Yeah, there is this cultural archive. So I'm also starting to try and build this archive. I've found that the more um, I get into kind of my community as of, of adoptees, I'm finding more and more adoptees who are also artists and creative professionals. And I've stumbled upon this, um, it's called adopteeculturalarchives.wordpress.com. They are a Belgian, Korean Belgian adoptee, from what I can tell, and they have this list of activists and artists and filmmakers and writers and books and films and shows and like all different kinds of things. It's all about adoption. It's, it's mainly skewed towards transnational adoption, but for those of us who are not transnational adoptions, it's still just this amazing, amazing amount of information and media and things for us to help us understand ourselves better, I think, and be a bit more aware so again, it's adopteeculturalarchives.wordpress.com. It's huge. Like there are yeah. so many links. It's a treasure trove for sure. Oh, thanks, Nicole. Thanks for bringing that to us. I have one more question before we wrap up. Is that okay? Yeah. You just you just said something, and I wish I had asked you about it when we were talking before, so I'm just going to ask you now. What do you think it is that brings so many adoptees into working in the creative field? Working creatively, you're working in this language that's not English or Spanish or French or whatever this um, you know, this language that has words, right? You're working in, in something else. And maybe you're a writer, but you're still working with writing as a creative art, you know, or you're a comedian, but you're still working with these words in this creative realm. And so you're building a different language, whether it's visual or time or you're building a different vocabulary. And I think that what we've experienced and the trauma we've experienced is it's so profound that, and we're oftentimes not allowed to feel those feelings or to express ourselves with it. We have to make up our own language for it, right? So that we can, and maybe we don't even know what that stuff means, but we can feel it. And working in the creative realm really gives us permission to do that. We don't necessarily have to articulate everything, but we can articulate it enough. I love that. Thank you. I'm putting you put you, put you on spot there, but that was so <laughs> Yeah, you did. I was like, oh man, I don't know. <laughs> Why do uh, we do it? Let me think about it. Oh, oh, Nicole, this was so good. Thank you so much for chatting with me. Um, where can we connect with you online? So you can connect with me on social media. My handles are at Nick R. Rad, so N I C R R A D, and that's on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, and then my website is NicoleRadamacher.com, N I C O L E R A D E M A C H E R.com. Yeah, and feel free to email me if you um, want to chat about anything. It's Nick, N I C, at NicoleRadamacher.com. Perfect. Thank you. And Mm -hmm. for sure, go check out Nicole's website and follow her to make sure you keep up with all the things that she's doing. Thank you. This was just such a great conversation. I loved hearing your story and I can't get that little picture spinner out of my head like I can picture I don't even know what it's called anymore but I can picture it and I just I'm stuck on that (laughs) (laughs) thank you so much Haley this has been great this show is brought to you by my patreon partners Patreon is a website that allows creators like me to raise monthly support to help me keep producing this podcast for you. As a special thank you for a monthly pledge, I have a secret Facebook group for adoptees only where we support each other through search and reunion issues and we get really real about all the things we are struggling with, like coming out of the fog. Come and join us. Adopteeson.com slash partner has all the details. Today, would you tell just one person about the show? It is literally by word of mouth that podcasts are able to grow their audience. 
if you were able to do that for me, it's just such a huge help to raise up adoptee voices worldwide. I'm so grateful for you. Thank you for listening. Let's talk again next Friday when we wrap up season three. (laughs) Okay, say it. No, you say it with me. Happy New Year's. Let's talk again next Friday.